you guys just keep asking for more Reddit stories, so I'm here to deliver. Let's read some more really cool, interesting, scary Reddit stories. And guys, I'm trying to hit 100k before the end of the year, and I think we can do it, so please subscribe, and let's get straight into this one. The old lady living next to me has no face. I recently moved into a new apartment in a quiet neighborhood somewhere in the Philippines, and I think I'm the only one that noticed something extremely wrong with the old lady living next to me. Let's call her Linda. Sometimes I see her during the day, watering plants on her little porch, getting the mail, or her simply sitting outside getting some sun. From what I heard, she's a retired nurse that worked in one of the asylums from back in the day. She also lived alone for a couple of years now after her husband passed away in 2010. We exchanged a few friendly highs and hellos a couple of times, and everything was good for a while. One time she gave me pasta. It tasted weird. I would always hear her record player playing old songs during afternoons. Linda was around 65 years old, had graying hair and a sweet smile on her lips every time you talked to her. She had this grandmotherly vibe to her. I liked that since I lost my grandma at a very young age, but we never became close. She was sort of distant and kept to herself. Fast forward to a couple of months since moving in, I worked late shifts and would usually come home at around 12 a.m. That's when the strange thing started occurring. As I was opening the gate to my apartment, I just felt like I was being watched. You know that feeling in the back of your neck and your spine just tingling out of nowhere. I glanced at Linda's house a couple of times before noticing all the lights were off. Odd. She usually left the front porch lights on through the night out of habit, but this was nothing to be alerted by. Maybe she simply forgot, but after a couple of nights like this, that feeling of being watched never left me. One night, I finally took a closer look into the darkness of her house and noticed someone sitting on her porch, just barely visible through the darkness. It was her. I couldn't see her face clearly, but I can make out the shape of her body. Thin, hair down, hunched over on a chair, not moving. She was facing my direction. I was also sure that she was the one who watched me these past few nights. I waved to her. No response. I shrugged it off. Tired from work, I didn't have time and energy to stress over what my neighbors were up to. But what could she be doing outside at 12 a.m.? I didn't think of these things back then, but it was certainly odd looking back. The next morning, I saw her outside talking to another neighbor. Just the usual. At a distance, she looked in my direction and smiled. I smiled back. But there was something about her face. Something out of order. Something very odd. When I was a kid, I remember my little sister having these stuffed toy dolls with faces just painted on them. It was like that with Linda. It was almost like her face was just painted on and there was nothing underneath those lines. It was subtle, but under the sun, it was almost uncanny. And her smile. Something about her smile that told me she knew I saw her the other night. It was terrifying. I left to see my mom over brunch and told her about the whole Linda situation. My mom jokingly told me about an urban legend back in her province of an aswang that steals people's faces. This creature is said to know when someone was about to die and would steal their faces to use in committing terrifying acts. Using charcoal, the creature would then doodle a new face on. I laughed at the idea and forgot about the whole thing. Everything went back to normal after that. Linda and I had exchanged a few words through the next few months. One afternoon she asked me if her record player was too loud and I said no. She even gave me an old pocket watch with a mirror on the other side of it. A pocket mirror and watch, she told me. It was supposed to be her husband's as she was trying to get rid of some of his things. But that was all. She went back to being distant and I went on with life. It was in December on that same year when I saw what I would describe as the scariest thing I've seen in my adult life. It was about 1am on a work week and I was just getting home from a tiring day when I felt it again. That eerie feeling of being watched. Her house was blacked out again and suddenly all those odd things about Linda started to fill my mind again. I froze in place. She was there. Or it was there. I could make out the shape of her body on the porch. She was standing this time. Her hair was down, moving in the wind. It started to rain and I was starting to get cold and shivering. I tried to find the courage to shine my phone's flashlight in her direction, but I was too scared scared of what it may uncover. Then I heard this very soft cry, a cry that you may hear from someone covering their mouth. I jumped and shined my flashlight in her direction. There was Linda, or what was once Linda, facing me. She wore a night sweater of some sort. She was very thin, and hair messed up from the wind. I screamed. Whatever it was standing in front of me wasn't Linda. She had no face. What was once the face of a neighbor that I knew was gone. It was as if someone had taken it off. It was just pale white skin as a face. I could hear this soft cry again as she tried to talk with no mouth. She started to lift one of her hands as if gesturing me to come over. I almost fainted. I never thought I could start my motorcycle
motorcycle as fast as I did, but I sped out of there and into the rainy night towards my mom's house. I never told anyone about what happened that night, and I managed to move out of my apartment the next week to hell with my security deposit. I also never saw Linda again. I tried my best to bury that memory for so long. All of this happened about 20 years ago, and I never told anyone until now. I never really did find out exactly what happened to Linda, my old neighbor, but I sometimes asked around. Some say she passed away the following year, some say she moved to live with her brother but left all her things behind, even her record player. It was like she just disappeared, but all this time I kept the pocket mirror watch she gave me. I sometimes look at myself in that small mirror and think about why my face sometimes looks like it's just painted on. That was a bit of a short one, but I thought it was pretty good. That had my attention the entire time, I don't know. Again, a little short, but I mean, I think it was pretty good for what it was trying to do. Next up, we have... An unknown caller saved my life. Some time ago, I had decided to go on a little personal vacation out into the woods of northern Arizona. I was experiencing a sort of malaise that was really messing with my creative flow and I needed a chance to really knuckle down and just enjoy the natural world again. I had spent six days out in the wilderness just enjoying the feeling of being in nature, but the night of day seven was one I will never forget. Noise. Something was waking me up. Groggily, I rolled over and looked at my phone. It was ringing. I looked to the top of it and blinked. No signal. That made sense. I had come out here for the isolation, a chance to clear my head and make some music again. So why was my phone ringing? How was my phone ringing? I stared at the number as my phone rang incessantly, an unknown caller. I heaved a tired sigh, swiped to answer, and croaked blarily, hello? You need to be ready. It knows you're there and is already here. It has come for you, came the voice on the other line. Who is this? Who am I speaking to? I asked. Asked, the exhaustion beginning to leave my voice. Be ready. It will be there soon. Don't open the door. The line went dead, and my phone blinked and the words, signal lost, flashed on the screen. Don't open. I rubbed the sleep from my eyes and warily watched my phone, waiting to see if it would ring again. I must be losing it, I murmured, placing my phone back in the nightstand and rolling back over to go to sleep. That's when the house thundered. Booming knocks shook the glass of the windows and rattled the glassware. Jesus! I spun the the door of my room and my mouth dropped. My door was closed, but it was shaking like something was trying to get in. Boom, boom, boom. Three knocks in short succession thundered against my bedroom door. I didn't remember locking it. The only door I locked was the front. It was the only one I figured I needed to out here. The angered knocking came again. Three strong blows and the rattling began anew. It shook the door and as I watched, I saw the frame begin to crack. My phone rang and the rattling stopped. Sparing a glance, I snatched it off the nightstand and looked at the number. Unknown caller. Again. Shakily, I swiped to answer the call and brought the phone to my ear, saying nothing. It knows you're in there. It isn't going to be light for long. Get under the bed. Hide. Then the line went dead again. A signal lost. I looked at the cracking door frame and wasted no time taking this mysterious caller's advice. Quickly, I crawled under the bed and watched. It was only minutes. I knew it was only minutes, but it felt like hours. I stared at the door, terror wrapping its cold arms around my gut. My breathing became ragged as my eyes remained glued to the door. It wasn't moving. There was no knocking. Had the caller been wrong this time? Was it done? Had it just given up? What was it? Questions raced through my skull, each firing out of the cannon of doubt before the next one could be rationalized. Could any of this be rationalized, though? Something had called me up and warned me of something else in my house. Now that something else was outside my door. I couldn't explain it, but I had this feeling. Like whatever it was that was out there was waiting for me to make a move. Like we were in some kind of troubled chess game. So I watched. I waited beneath that bed for agonizing minutes. The sounds began shortly after that, soft scratching noises, almost inaudible from my position. The one my signalist savior alleged would keep me safe. I never left- I never let my gaze drift from the door, and I'm glad I kept it there, because watching what happened next defied logic. The door itself began to bulge inward. I could hear the wood splintering as the center continued to bubble toward me. Then it exploded. Debris and lethal wooden screws 
scrap fired throughout the bedroom. I wasn't spared when this happened. My hiding place provided shelter from the brunt of the door's destruction, but I was peppered with fragments of splintered wood that dug themselves into my skin. I wanted to cry out in pain, but the sight of what was beyond it caught the scream in my throat. There, standing in the doorway, I saw a pair of feet. Massive legs. They must have been at least three feet across themselves, but that wasn't the strangest thing. The skin was no tone I have ever seen on a human. It was this mossy green and brown, and the texture was so, so wooden, like a pair of tree trunks. Slowly, the thing in my doorway ambled its way into my room. I could hear its heavy, ragged breaths, like some sort of hunting beast. It was at the foot of my bed. The scent of moss and pine clung heavily to it, but there was another scent I caught as it just stood there. Rot. Death. The pungent odor of decaying meat clung to the creature's wooden legs. I had to cover my nose and mouth to keep from retching as it circled the bed. Was it gonna throw up and pull me out from underneath? Was this monster just waiting for the perfect chance to tear me to shreds? What the hell was it? The feet turned and suddenly my blood felt like ice. My whole body shivered as the temperature in the room suddenly plummeted. I could see my breath as this thing let out an ear-shattering roar. I can't place the sound, but it reminded me of a mixture between a jet engine's roar and a grizzly bear's growl. I watched from my hiding place as the nightstand was lifted and launched across the room. I could only hear the thing shatter as the creature tore the place apart. My eyes were discs in my head, and my hands were clamped over my mouth to hide any sounds of breathing or whimpering. But just as it spun to face the bed, it stopped. Instead, whatever it was turned and shambled out of my room. What the hell? What the hell? Those were the only words I could choke out as the creature disappeared from my sight. Then the phone rang again. Terrified, I seized it, trying to silence the ringer. I swiped to answer the caller and immediately began to whisper into the phone. What the hell was that? Who are you? How the hell did you know it was coming? There's no time for any of that. It knows where you are. You need to run. Jump out the window and keep running until you lose sight of this place. Keep going until you reach the highway. Don't come back until morning. Are you kidding me? That thing is huge. I, I can't outrun it. You have to. It's the only way you win this. Then the call cut out. Signal lost. I steadied my breathing and psyched myself back up, shooting out from under the bed as I heard that dreadful roar again. It was coming back. I didn't have time to think. No time to find shoes. I bolted toward the now shattered window and dove, slicing my arms and legs against the shards of glass. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, urging me to ignore everything else. I ran, bolted through the forest as fast as my legs would carry me. Twigs and rocks tore into my feet, but I kept going. Even as my chest began to tighten and my lungs began to feel like there was a fire being set beneath them, I ran. I couldn't hear the monster behind me anymore. Maybe it stayed in my cabin. Maybe it kept looking elsewhere. Every ounce of me just hoped that I had gotten lucky, but the voice on the phone told me to keep running until I hit the highway. So I did. I ran through miles of backcountry woods, never stopping, pushing myself far beyond anything I thought I was capable of. Just to get away from whatever the hell that thing was, I could see darkness starting to push its way into my vision. My legs were beginning to feel like they were made of stone. My body ached and every muscle screamed for me to stop, but I kept pushing. When I burst through the tree line onto the road, I stopped. Almost instantly, I began sobbing and dropped to my knees. I gazed up at the moon as my phone began to ring again. I pulled it out of my pocket and looked at the number. Before I could do anything else, darkness overtook me. I woke the following day in a hospital bed. Apparently, someone had discovered my unconscious and bloodied body on the side of the road. The sheriffs had a million questions, none of which I had a good answer for. They thought my story sounded like something I had made up, but when they went to the cabin, many of them were singing a different tune. It looks like you got lucky and escaped one of the biggest bears I've ever seen, one of them said. I didn't find it, but the claw marks in the wood made it look like a damn dinosaur. Grizzlies are huge, son, but not even they leave marks like that. When I asked about the phone calls, they just shook their heads. There's no cell service that far out. You might have imagined that part in everything. It took me over a week to recover from my injuries. I was told I had lacerated a tendon in my right arm and that it would never quite function the way it had before. That was the arm I used to play guitar, and to this day, there are still certain notes my fingers just can't quite nail anymore. The day of my discharge, I was given the things they had found me with and given an escort back to the cabin. The debris was mostly cleaned up by the time I arrived to collect my things, but the damage to the building itself was visible, and the cops were right. Whatever the hell it was that came after me that night must have been massive to leave the marks it did so deep in the woods. I checked my phone as I crossed the threshold of the house to gather my things and sighed. No signal. Well, thanks, whoever you are. 
there, I muttered, gathering what stuff was left after the attack. To this day, I don't know who called me or what it was in that cabin, but frankly, I don't think I want to know. Alright, this one's a great act. This is another pretty great story. This one was less creepy, but it was just really good at keeping my attention the whole time, and I don't know, I was on edge reading this. I don't know what the hell it could have been. It's like a human with green feet, dude. It was a Shrek? Did he see Shrek, maybe? Could be Shrek, I don't know, man. <laughs> Could be... Dude, it was, it was Mike Wazowski, bro. This guy was just like one of the kids that sleep over in the end of Monsters U. <laughs> Alright guys, y'all don't care about my dumb jokes and my Monsters University references, so let's get straight into the next story. I'm so proud of my son for no longer being afraid of the dark. He was always petrified. He used to climb into bed with my wife and me every night. Mommy, daddy, I'm afraid of the dark. This had become a routine. We tried everything. Lying in bed with him until he fell asleep, night lights, teddy bears, nothing worked. I tried to convince my wife on many occasions to just let him sleep with us at night, but she refused and said it was a phase. We had to be consistent. This habit broke when we decided to move from our two bedroom flat into our first real home. We'd been saving for this home for almost 10 years and it was everything we had dreamed of. Real wood flooring, rooms so spacious that if you yelled it would echo, and a huge back garden. The first night we went to bed, I was sure our son would climb into bed with us. I was stunned when we didn't wake up until 9am and he was still asleep. I sat at the table, sipping my morning coffee and reading the paper when he came toddling downstairs. Good morning buddy, I see you slept all night in your big boy bed but by yourself. I couldn't contain my excitement. It may sound ridiculous, but I was worried that this would go on forever. He let out a little chuckle. Don't be silly, daddy. I wasn't alone. I was instantly confused. Did my wife sneak into his room and sleep with him? Did he get into our bed and then go back in the morning? What do you mean, son? I didn't hear you once. My friend was with us, he said with a huge grin on his face. Daddy, can I watch Bluey while eating breakfast this morning? He asked innocently, giving puppy dog eyes. No, son, we've just got that sofa and I don't want it covered in eggs. Suddenly, what he had said a moment before dawned on me. Son, what friend? I asked, puzzled. My friend, he smiled. Please, Dad, I won't get eggs anywhere, I promise, he begged. Not today, little one. Your mom would go crazy at me. Maybe tomorrow. Oh, he frowned, slumping down at the table. He began munching his breakfast, eating as fast as he could so he wouldn't miss the new episode. Later that day, I spoke to my wife and told her about what our child had said earlier. She told me not to overthink it. If anything, it's good that he has an imaginary friend friend, especially if it helps him go to sleep. I agreed and continued with his bedtime routine. I couldn't believe it when I woke up and he wasn't sandwiched between us for the second night in a row. Again, I went downstairs to have my coffee and read my newspaper. Suddenly, he came flying down the stairs. Daddy, can we go to the park today? He said, as if he just came up with the greatest idea ever. Of course we can, I laughed slightly, especially since you sloped all alone again. He looked at me, confused. Daddy, I've told you, I'm not alone. My friend is with me. I decided to entertain him. Oh, yeah? Yeah, what does this friend look like? His face brightened up again. I can't see much of his face because he only comes out of the wardrobe when it's dark. He has a big smile and long fingernails. He taps on the edge of the bed to help me sleep. Needless to say, I was disturbed. That sounded terrifying to me, but kids are imaginative and say all kinds of crazy things. Wow, he sounds cool. What's his name? He told me not to tell you. He sang in a cheeky way, as if he thought it was funny that I wasn't allowed to be in it on the secret. Come on, tell me, and I'll let you watch Bluey while you eat breakfast today. I smirked, thinking I had won the war. Really? He exclaimed. Then suddenly he paused. His face went blank. He turned around and looked towards the ajar coat room that was in the hallway separating the kitchen and the living room. He turned back around, lowered his head. I can't tell you, daddy, he said, sounding rather disappointed. He hopped up to the kitchen table, looking defeated, and started eating his toast. I won't lie, I got kind of freaked out. I peered into the hallway, into the cloak room. Nothing seemed to miss. It was dark, as if it needed a light bulb, but nothing out of the ordinary. My wife's words ran through my head. This was a good thing. That night, he was rather tuckered away from his day at the park. My wife and I were excited to have a full night together and we were going to make the most of it. Eating junk food in bed while watching a movie. Something that we hadn't been able to do since our son was born. Suddenly, all the fizzy pop hit me and I got up to use the bathroom. I hopped out of bed and made my way to the bathroom. I thought maybe I'd check on our little man and his friend on the way. I placed my hand on the doorknob and my blood ran cold. Before I got the chance to open the door, I heard tap, tap, tap. It sounded just like... Like 
nails on wood. I froze, my heart thumping wildly in my chest. The sound was unmistakable, a slow, deliberate tapping, like fingernails drumming against the wooden bed frame. My hand trembled as I finally mustered the courage to turn the knob and push the door open. The room was bathed in a soft, eerie glow from the nightlight. I scanned the room quickly, my eyes darting to the wardrobe first. It stood slightly ajar, casting a long shadow across the floor, but it was the bed that held my attention. There he was, my son, sound asleep, a peaceful expression on his face, but the tapping continued, rhythmic and persistent. I swallowed hard and took a cautious step towards the wardrobe, my mind racing with every conceivable explanation. Perhaps it was a branch tapping against the window, or maybe a loose floorboard. I needed to see, to reassure myself that it was nothing more than a child's vivid imagination. With each step, the tapping grew louder, more insistent. I reached out and pulled my wardrobe door open, expecting to see nothing but a collection of small clothes and toys. Instead, my breath caught in my throat. The wardrobe was empty, save for a few hangers, swaying slightly, as if disturbed by a breeze. And then a chill ran down my spine. From behind me, I heard a soft, almost inaudible whisper. I told him not to tell you. I spun around, my heart pounding so hard I could hear it in my ears. The room was empty apart from my son, still sound asleep. I backed away slowly, unable to tear my eyes away from the dark corners of the room. It felt as though something was watching me, something unseen and sinister. I closed the wardrobe door firmly, trying to steady my breathing. Just then, my son stirred and opened his eyes, looking straight at me. Daddy, he murmured sleepily. My friend says you shouldn't be in here. I forced a smile, my voice trembling. It's all right, buddy. Go back to sleep. He nodded and closed his eyes again, a serene smile on his face. I backed out of the room, closing the door behind me as quietly as possible. As I stood in the hallway, the tapping came to a halt. I hurried back to our bedroom, my mind racing. My wife looked up from her book, concern etched on her face. Everything all right? She asked. I nodded, though I was far from convinced. Just to branch against the windows, I lied, trying to convince myself as much as her. But as I lay down next to her, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. The house, which had once seemed so perfect, now felt ominous and foreboding. And the words of my son echoed in my head. I wasn't alone. As I drifted off to sleep, I couldn't help but wonder about the friend who only came out of the wardrobe when it was dark, with a big smile and long fingernails. The friend who tapped on the edge of the bed to help him sleep. And for the first time since I was little, I found myself petrified of the dark. Suddenly, a creak of the wardrobe sounded. My eyes snapped open to stare at the ceiling. I couldn't move as my chest began pounding. Tap, tap, tap. Oh my god, another really good one, dude. This one was like short and sweet, but it was really good. I don't know, I mean, stuff with kids and monsters and the dark always, always get to me. I know something about it, man. Maybe, maybe it's like nostalgia or something. But also, these guys are British, bro. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be supporting this story. That means that you slash playful underscore donut 232 is a British dude. He was saying mum and like coat room. That's not, is that an American thing? Am I just stupid? Maybe I'm just actually like a, like a dumb. I don't know. I've never heard that before. <laughs> Either way, guys, um, I really hope you enjoyed this Reddit stories video. I had a great, 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 great time reading these. If you want more of this kind of content, just, you know, leave a comment. Let me know. Leave a like. Um, again, join my Discord. DM me any stories you have that you want me to read. Follow my Instagram. And again, I'm really trying to hit 100k before the end of the year and we can do it. We can do it. It's gonna happen, guys. Thank you so much. You guys are really the best. Now, everybody have a great night, man. Sweet dreams.